I accelerated my success as a realtor by tuning into podcasts, and now it's time for me to give back. Join me while I chat with some of the top agents in the industry, gaining insight into how they became experts at selling real estate so you can too. Who am I? Well, I'm Mark Rawmaker. I went from selling $5 million in real estate my first year as a part-time agent to running a mega icon team who has sold over $260 million in real estate in just five years. I'll be your host while we talk to yet another amazing realtor crushing the game. Welcome to the Real Estate Ninja Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate Ninja Podcast. In this episode, I'm super pumped. We're gonna talk with former personal trainer turned realtor, Harif Hazera. We're going to hear how Harif went from his first sale of $200,000, his first listing, to now selling homes well into the millions. He dives deep into discovering the secrets behind his success and reveals powerful insights on what it takes to have a winning mindset. This dude is all about mindset. Plus, get exclusive access to his personal tips on transforming your own career in real estate so you can begin achieving the same results, especially in the luxury market. It's super inspirational. He's so smart. You're going to love this interview. But before we get started, if you could make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode when we drop one every Thursday. And also, I would love it if you gave us a five-star review. That way, more people like you can see the podcast and they can join in on this incredible journey. Now, let's chat with Harif. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to the Real Estate Ninja Podcast. Well, on today's episode, we have a very special guest. We're excited to have Harif Hazera, one of Central Florida's most trusted luxury real estate advisors, join us. As a member of the Premier Sotheby's International Realty Network, Harif provides unparalleled white glove service to his clients and is known for his expertise, ability to listen, and connect distinguished buyers to some of Central Florida's most coveted properties. With over $100 million in personal sales and a top 1% ranking among all real estate agents nationwide, Harif's uncom uncompromising honesty and attention to detail have earned him lasting relationships with his clients. Join us today as we learn about Harif's success in the industry and his insight on luxury real estate. Welcome to the show, my man. How are you? I'm doing great, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, man. We're super pumped to have you. Luxury, we're going to dive into that. Um, we're actually in the same market. Uh, we were just talking about that before the before we started this episode, which is super exciting. We've never met each other. So I'm I'm excited to pick your brain and learn all the stuff that you have going on, man. So um, let's start at the very beginning, right? How What did you do before real estate? Most people don't do it when they graduate high school, right? And then what brought you into real estate? Yeah, great question. So I think like many of us, I kind of stumbled into it. But um, before I was in real estate, I was doing, I was in the oil and gas industry, actually, in my early 20s. I was negotiating a $50 million contract when I was 23 years old, uh, wet behind the ears, didn't know what I was doing, but hungry, go-getter. And that company, that deal didn't end up going through and it actually made the, uh, made the company kind of downsize. So there was a lot riding on that. And so from there, I developed a passion for health and fitness, and that kind of morphed into this was right around the time when CrossFit was blowing up. Yep. And so got my CrossFit level one training certification, started a personal training business. And uh, long story short, you know, I just got sick and tired of struggling financially. Yep. And um, I think sometimes a lot of people confuse their passion that it's supposed to be their vocation and that's not always the case. And so for me, I kind of kept it as a hobby and uh, yeah, from there, honestly, man, I was, I was kind of praying for like a sign. Like I remember I was making $24,000 a year. I was newly married. I was 25 years old. I remember arguing over uh, an overdraft charge that happened because I, I got the guacamole on a Chipotle bowl and that extra $2.50 sent us into overdraft. And I remember arguing with my wife. I mean, that's how it was. It was, we were struggling, brother. Um, I was living in Kissimmee at the time, no furniture, just like literally eating off the floor, but I was hungry. And so um, literally I was, I was like, God, I need a sign. I need, I need something. And somebody came up to me out of nowhere and was like, Hey man, you'd be a great real estate agent. And I was like, please, I'd rather, I'd rather go jump off a bridge. You right. know? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, two days later, somebody else walked up to me and said, Hey, I don't know really much about you, but you make a killer real estate agent. I'm like, Okay. And then literally, I remember it happened again, two days later, somebody else came up to me and said it again. And I took that as my sign. And as soon as I got in, it was like plopping a, a fish in water. It was just so natural for me. It was exactly what I had needed. And we could talk a little bit about it later, but I think it's important for us 
as agents to really think about vehicles and and how we maneuver in our business and not thinking like a traditional real estate agent. So that's how that's how oh, yeah. I landed here. That's amazing. So what year what year did you get into real estate? What when was that? I got my license uh, December 2015. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, that was a year before me. So I remember we kind of had the same journey, which is cool. What was your first year like? You said it was a fi like a fish in water. Like, did you just and w and where did you go? What brokerage and what you know all that stuff? Yeah. So um, my father in law was and is actually a broker, and he used to teach classes at that time to get your your real estate license. And so I took it with him, and then it was the obvious connection just because he was family, and he offered me a very favorable split, but. I learned quickly. I think the smartest thing that I did, and I really got this from coaching in CrossFit and personal training is I would have people that would come to me that have been working out for years and years and years, but not getting any results. And then as soon as they got coaching, that's when they, you, they got the results in three months, you know, six months, their whole entire life changed. And so the, I think the smartest thing that I did was I hired a real estate coach. And I remember day one, the day that I got my license, I had already had my first listing in place. My cousins were flipping a property. It was listed with another agent. That's not yeah. normal, man. <laughs> no, no. But, um, you know, I, I just, I knew, and I think I'm really leaning into this heavy now this year, actually eight years in, that my eighth year in now. But I would, I would encourage, you know, anybody listening, your biggest asset, your biggest value proposition and even your biggest value where the gold is is in your phone it's people that know you and i know we hear that all the time but really i don't think a lot of us tap into that gold mine that we have and so i was i had no choice i'm struggling financially i have nowhere to go we sold a uh i bought my first townhouse in 2010 i had like forty thousand dollars in in uh, profit that i made off of that paid off all of our debt kind of started the 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 slate clean so to speak and I just started making calls, letting everybody know that, you know, I'm a, I'm a real estate agent. I'm getting my license. And, um, yeah, so my, it turns out my cousins were flip, they were flipping this random property. It's so funny. I still remember 1651 Viburnum Lane. That you was never my first your, listing. Yeah, you never forget. Never. Two, $200,000 listing, man. And I treated it as if it was a $20 million listing, you know? And, right, right. and and I remember telling my cousins, I said, hey, look, you guys have been sitting on this listing for so long. It's been a couple months, but I was dragging it. I was like, look, you know, if, if this thing is not sold by the time I get my license, give me a shot. I'll sell it for you. And he said, deal. And sure enough, 30 days later, that property was still sitting. I took it over and boom, the, the rest is history. Sold it, man. That's amazing. So what does your business currently, I mean, I just gave some stats out, but what does it look like today? Are you, you have a team? Are you single agent? Are you, what's, what's the structure look like and how much are you selling? Yeah. So I'll kind of give you to piggybacking off the first question that you asked too, cause I didn't answer it directly. But, um, the first, first year in real estate, I think I did right around three points, um, 3.7 million. That's good. And then I jumped to like 4.1 and then I went to six and then I went to nine. And then from nine, I was, I was seeing a pattern where I was growing on average of about 30% increases every single year. Yeah. And so I remember when I hit 9 million, I wrote down my goals for the next year. I was like, I want to do, you know, 12 million. And I just felt like I heard this voice say like, that's easy. Like you, you, you don't, that's going to happen need, no matter. Right. That's, that's going to happen. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, I remember just feeling like I truly believe it was God. Like, you know, why don't you put something on there that's scary and trust me for it. And so I did, I, I put 20 million and, um, December, I think the last week of December, we literally closed just over 20 million that following year, more than doubled my sales. And, that's um, amazing. And, that, that's great. It, nine to 20 in one year, man. That's legit. Nine to 20. And then I did a double again. So for the last two couple, last two years, we, we did just over 40 million. So, and that's, so let's yeah. unpack that going from nine to 20. Like how did you, what'd you do different? You know I mean? Don't, and, and not the, Oh, I just made more phone calls or I texted more people. No. Or I, like what, like there's a massive strategy there that you executed. What, what would that look like? So I, I will, let's, we'll dive into the granule techniques, but I think it's really important. I hope the audience catches this one piece because there's a famous quote that Elon Musk says, 
Um, if you give yourself three months to clean your house, it'll take you three months. If you give yourself three weeks, it'll take three weeks, three days or three hours. Brilliant. In other words, what you set your expectations to, that's what you're going to default to. So if somebody's listening and says, man, I just want to sell three million or I just want to sell five million, ten, whatever the number is, until you get that right, you're, the techniques, you don't realize you're going to be self-sabotaging. And that I'm big on mindset. Uh, the, the book, The Miracle Morning, absolutely changed my life, completely changed my life. That's what drew me, honestly, from nine to 20. I was already doing a lot of the things right, but I didn't have the belief, the beliefs and the, the foundation to set things on. And so I, would, I didn't realize how much I was self-sabotaging my success because just without going too deep into the weeds here, I, I reached a point where I realized that I didn't feel worthy of more than the success that I had already hit in that limit. And so these limiting beliefs are major. They go unnoticed. A lot of the times as agents, we want to dive into, you know, how do I overcome objections or how do I get more leads? And all that stuff is great. You should do that. But I promise you, if you don't deal with what's up here first, yeah. you could have the best techniques in the world. You're going to stay stuck. And, you know, most of the times you don't stay stuck, you, you end up regressing. Yeah, those limiting beliefs are so powerful. And it's like a, a nice imposter syndrome, too, because we all get into mm -hmm. this and we and you get just shot out of a cannon. Like you had a listing, mm -hmm. you never knew how to sell a home, but you're like, I think I'll figure this out. So but mm -hmm. that that kind of sticks with you. And it, like through through the first few years, even though you have massive success, you're still like, and then you you sw hit that switch of like, wait a second, I'm just doubting myself when there's no reason to doubt myself, right? Yeah, it's 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 even deeper than that too. The doubt kind of flows from, and 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 I know every anybody's like, yeah, but what did you do exactly? I promise you guys, like, I did not do very many things different. I truly did not. I was never the type of person to call. I don't cold call. I hardly market myself. I've got half an Instagram page that I need to get back up and running. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I, it's just 90% of my business is referral based. And that was one of the biggest things that my coach drilled into me from day one is that if you really have to focus on other people's success and then your success will follow in arrears. And I took that to heart. And so I treated every customer as if they were just royalty and that turned into you know a big referral based business but to go back you know it, it it wasn't until i dealt with the fear of failure the fear of success which is the other side of the same coin which often doesn't get that's talked about that's a real about. thing that's a real thing it it truly is and 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 um just appraising no pun intended in real mm. estate terms but appraising my beliefs holding them up to the light you know, because a lot of us, we want to succeed. I remember, I remember getting my first million dollar listing. I was three months into the, to the business. So three months in, I got my first million dollar listing, 4042 Ethan Lane. You guys can look this up, Baldwin <laughs> Park. And it was an expired listing. It was just so happened. Somebody walked into an open house and we connected and then the, her listing was getting ready to expire. And she wasn't very happy with, you know, the, the service that she was getting. And so long story short, you know, I remember sitting in my my broker's office and 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 telling her, like, I don't know, like, why is she going to want to hire me? And she's like, why not? Well, I, I don't live in a million dollar home. I don't drive a fancy car. I don't have any anything. You know, I I put these you're, people. Yeah. Right. You're uh, unrelatable on a, on a, to her. You're like, we're not I'm, the same. So why would she want to hire somebody that's, that's lower than her on, on, a, on status? Right. A hundred percent. And I think honestly, this is why a lot of agents would like to break into the luxury market, but they don't, they don't, they won't say that, but if they're coming, if they're honest with themselves, they don't feel there's like this hidden sense of like, I'm not worthy to be, you know, in that space or why would they choose me? And all of that, all of that fear, if you really think about it, fear is very selfish. It's self oriented. It's trying to protect your own image right? It's, it's, you're thinking, well, what are they going to think about me instead of you flipping the, the, the script and saying, no, how can I best serve them? Because I'll tell you, I had never gotten, a, I never had a million dollar listing. I'm only three months into the business. Okay. I've sold, I think at that point I sold a $200,000 property and like a $167,000 condo out in East Orlando. Right. Yeah. Maybe there was something else. I don't remember, but, but the point is, you know, I knew what I was doing. I was passionate. I was creative. 
with the coaching, it gave me the ammunition that I needed to talk with confidence. I knew what to say, but I didn't have that, that proof of concept yet or that, that reference point. And so it was a struggle for me, but long story short, I remember in that listing presentation, all the questions that I feared, well, how many properties have you sold? What'd you do last year? How long have you been doing this? I'm only three months in. Everything that I feared would happen, none of it, none of the questions came. None of it. She didn't care. We signed the listing agreement and I brought on another agent to co-list it with me. And uh, yeah, we, we sold that property. So let me unpack that with you then. So based on, so you didn't know this person or you, you did know this person, the million dollar listing? No, no. I met her in an open house. Perfect. So how did you gain trust and that, at that kind of level in that short amount of time? Mm. All right. So uh, look, and by the way, that, that's such a good question. So, and, and, and try to be a little more specific than like, well, I asked her good questions, right? We all do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. Part so, of it, but you know what I mean? <laughs> we'll break it down into two pieces. So I'll give you the, the vague answer, which is, which sets the tone for the specifics, but the, the generalized answer is important. I know this is, this is going to be like nails on a chalkboard for those of us who love technique, but it sounds silly. You just get them to like you and not in a, not in a fake way, in a real authentic way, you become genuinely interested in them and their problems. And why are they selling? What is it that they want? A lot of the times as, as, Agents, we get, get so transactional. And I think this is why 90% of my business is referral based because I'm not transactional like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think in terms of business and I have goals and all of that. But sure. when it comes to people, um, you know, I'm genuinely interested in you. And, and what is it that you're looking? Why, why do you want to sell? Like we think we hear that word sell and we think of like from a dollar sign. But when we're in that position, there's usually a, a life event that's taking place and it's a big event, right? It's usually Americans most largest transactions that we make in our lifetime. And so when you step inside of the shoes of your client and really start to think from their perspective, then you're able to serve them better. So I think very quickly um, we gain trust. Just, she could tell that I wasn't like most other agents that are just trying to like, they were very transactional. I was yeah, just talk about interested. their marketing and talk about all their stuff, right? They talk that you right. you let them talk more than you talk. Hundred percent. The best salespeople ask the best questions. That's a hundred percent a fact. They don't they don't talk as much. And so, but real quick to to get more specifics into your into your question, you know, I remember the the open house. Um, that open house was booming, and my wife she wasn't even licensed at the time, but she was super supportive, and I I was like babe, I need you to do this open house with me because I, I predicted that it was going to be busy. It was in Baldwin Park. I had I didn't finish the story, sorry, just to tie the loop because people yeah, are going to be wondering. It. I left my father's brokerage. I was there for maybe not even a month, if that. And I quickly realized that your environment is everything. And my coach told me, don't worry about your split. That's the last thing you need to worry about. Just go into an environment with a brokerage that it sells the types of properties that you're looking to sell. Boom. And leverage their wins and success. And so that's what I did. I ended up at Berkshire Hathaway. So watch this, watch the story, watch the timeline. I go to Berkshire Hathaway. Within like a month or two, I I asked one of the agents who had a listing that was vacant in Baldwin Park if I could do a, a open house for her listing. And she let me. And that's where I I met Marsha, who landed my and how I landed my first million dollar listing. listing. So your environment really is everything and commission is honestly, I would, it's still the, not that it's not important. And when you're doing, you know, when, when you've earned your stripes and yes, you want to negotiate those things, but it's still the least important thing to me. To me, it's environment, you know, brand. When I walk into a, a listing presentation, they may not know who Harif Azera is, but you know, they know who Sotheby's is. They know, you know, if you have a great brand that you're a part of. And so, um, anyway, well, just going, the way you up, the way you hold yourself and the way you present yourself is that's your brand, man. You're it's your costume, 100%. right? <laughs> you know what I mean? 100%. You look, you look sharp. I looked you up on social, man. You got, you, you look sharp every time you're on social. And I'm sure that's way, the way you look when you walk into $10 million listings, you're like, look, why wouldn't you hire me, man? Look at me. I, like, this is what I, so I present myself. I, I appreciate that. And I, and I, and I learned that, uh, I do like fashion, but more so than anything, that's right. Your first impression is 
is everything. And I think IBM did a study. They put their best salesperson in three different suits. Do you know this story? No, I don't. Okay, so so they put their be- they they put their best salesperson in three different suits: a blue suit, a black suit, and a brown suit. Same sales guy, same pitch, same product, same everything. At the end of those three months, the guy who had worn the blue suit had significantly outperformed than than when he was wearing the brown suit and when he was wearing the black suit. And so psychology goes into this piece. That you, if you haven't gathered that for me yet, I, I love psychology. I love to see what makes us tick and, and how we make decisions and things like that. But um, yeah, so fashion is important, but more importantly, you know, knowing you, what to wear. But again, you aligned yourself with a brand that you want to be. Your brand is aligned with who you are as a person and, and your brand Bingo. is your reputation, right? That's what a brand is, is who you are. So um, exactly. that's awesome. So let's let's skip forward a little bit because yeah. I want to make sure we, un- we, we get the luxury part of it. So you sold a bunch of homes, sure. you sold millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? You jumped from nine to 20, 20 to 40. So what's your average price point right now? Give We're just shy of a million. Okay. So what's your highest, what's the highest one you've ever sold? 5.5. Okay. 5.550. 5. 5, 5, yeah. So, and I'm in your market too, and we don't have 50, I mean, we do, but the, the 30, $40 million homes just don't come by. So a $5 million property is massive luxury in Orlando. So you're a luxury agent. What, like, I know that you, you said mindset brand, but there's a different, there's a different level that you're, you're bringing now to be consistent with it. It was, you know what I mean? I'm sure even when you got that million dollar listing, you're like, well, that was lucky, <laughs> even though yep. it was skill set, right? So, yeah, how, yeah. so what's your what do you do now to continue to just burn that that situation where like people who are selling a bunch of like million dollar, two million, three million dollar properties, like they have to use you? Where, where how did yeah. you get there? That's a great question. So, um, list. I know we hear this all the time, but I'll unpack it. Listings is is where it's at. Um, when when you get a, a luxury listing, you should market that thing like crazy, spend the extra money, shoot the video with you in it, shoot the content, let the world know that you have a luxury listing and send out the mailers. I mean, go pull out all the stops because it's not every day, especially when you're first starting out that, that these opportunities come. And I think I leveraged that really, really well. So, um, we did open houses at that, that, uh, my first million dollar listing every weekend. And and this is the fastest way that you could break into a new price point is once you have a, a, a property that you're able to host an open house for in a you know, million dollar price point, guess who's coming to those open houses? Yes, you get some tire kickers. Yes, you get some people that waste your time, but huh, you get some people that are in there that can afford those properties and then some. Right. And so that was the the fastest way that I started breaking into it. And then now I do the same thing. It's it's not a secret silver bullet. It is um, whenever I have a listing, I do everything I can to market that. I tell the world. I just went on a listing appointment last week based off of a mailer from a property that I sold in Winter Park for two point six million. I sold out a, a, a big, and it's not the cheap stuff, too, guys. By the way, <laughs> yeah, remember the use? type of yeah. yeah so you- I use eight eight and a half by eleven. And I go EDDM, so it gets to their 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 door perfectly intact. It's not beat up through all the the mail system, you know, and everything. Yeah. And and I just I have you know with, with our brokerage, we have a, a thirty one staff team member uh, marketing department, and they they design a beautiful brochure for me. And then boom, I just start pumping it out, and uh, and yeah, and it, you, it leads. You do to like a, the, the neighborhood, or you do a, a mile radius, or how do you farm that? And how many times yeah. do you do it? So with EDDM, they, it's based on routes. And um, so it, it just depends on which route, but you pick a zip code and then you can pick whatever routes you want to go to. So most of us know, all right, if I want to hit a neighborhood, I got to ch- choose this route. And then you calculate how many addresses are on that route. And then you could order your, your postcards from there. And then, yeah, I do it as often as I possibly can. You know, it's any, anybody knows, every, everybody knows this maybe, but few people actually follow this. Um, marketing is, is a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? A lot of us are looking too short sighted on this stuff. We'll, 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 we'll spend some money on, on advertising and then we'll, 
well, what's my ROI in the first month? It doesn't work like that. It took me a year. I've spent thousands of dollars before I got my first listing in my neighborhood. But guess what happened? As soon as I got the first one, that led to the second one. Now I'm going, you know, it's it's building. So I think you really need to be consistent. That is the key when it comes to to marketing. And that's how I continue to to get these these uh, listings and these opportunities. Let me ask you this. When you have a, a, a house over a million, right, a listing, do you have a, a certain budget you have intact, like going into it? Or you're like, this one, I need, I need to pour like, and what is like a, a guesstimate just so people can understand, including myself, how much do you spend on like a $2 million listing on, on a marketing mm. before it even, like right when it goes live from, from media to the, the, the flyers to everything? Yeah, that's a, such a great question. So uh, I'll tell you right off the rip, before the listing goes live, we I spend about twenty five hundred dollars just on photos and video. So um, yeah. then it, it's top tier. It's I'm getting twilight photos. I'm getting, you know, the the all all of it. I want to capture the property in its best light. And then um, thankfully for me, with my brokerage, a lot of the cost gets they take care of. So we get 50 soft touch, beautiful four page brochures. That's just part of the package. They, they do everything from posting it on wall street journal, uh, all the big outlets, not just, you know, Orlando Sentinel and stuff, because, you know, when you got a higher price point, a, a luxury listing, you, you need to get that reach out there. And, um, so they, they handle everything. I mean, it go, they, we have just listed postcards that they take care of for me. So we send those just listeds around the neighborhoods, getting our brand out there. Um, man, if I had to put a number on it based, based on what was spent before we're ready to go live. Yeah. It, it'd probably be around $5,000. You Which know, seems like you know, a lot, but then what, you know, what's a commission on a $2 million property? Exactly. Exactly. So like, the potential not, there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's peanuts. It is peanuts. compared to even when I, you know, if I have a $300,000 property, I still spend a ton of money on the media because why wouldn't you're going to make it back? Because then if you don't sell it at all, you don't make anything. Right. Exactly. So, but it, it, and here's the thing, though. Here's what I, I think where a lot of real estate agents go wrong is, they're like, OK, let's say you have a property. Knock on wood. I've never had an expired listing before. Uh, actually, I take that back. I had a, a 10 acre parcel in St. Cloud that was like basically a that. swamp land. Yeah. And I had it under contract <laughs> twice, but the seller, I couldn't get her down to reality. <laughs> but residential prop, I've literally never had a single uh, expired list. I've sold some pretty unique listings. But um, I think importantly, too, when, you, when you're committed to marketing, See, it, it, this is not like, a, again, a transactional thing. It's a frame of mind. It's, hey, I'm committed to promoting my business. As a business owner, I am going to promote my business, period. You know, I, it, so to go back to your question, how much do I spend? I don't even know. I spend it wherever, wherever I see be, an right? opportunity. Yeah, if it makes sense, because, you know, it's, you know, that's just how, that's well, just like how you said, my mind it's works. A, it's a marathon. So you can't, a lot of times you can't look back and say, well, that was a good ROI on that. Never. You, know I mean? you can't. How, how did, how does Coca-Cola justify spending millions of dollars on a 30 second Super Bowl ad? You're telling me they're going to be looking at what was my ROI? You couldn't even quantify no, that. Oh man, they don't know who watched it and went to go buy Coke because of that or like watched it and then 2 years later bought a Coke because they saw an ad on Facebook or decided right? to put a Coke machine into their business or because they the big the big companies get this. I think as real estate agents so we don't think like businesses and so we think per we, transactional. We think like that's how much it. I made from that and what was my profit on this and I sold 40 million and I made this and I net, you know, I made 30% or 40, whatever that is. You know what I mean? Exactly. So it's yeah. hard though. Cause it feels like kind of a free fall because most of us weren't business owners You go yep. before, you know, and now we're just running these businesses that we, we talk about millions and millions of dollars and we're in charge yeah. now when there's no school really. I mean, there's business, but there's no like, Hey guys, I run a real estate business and you should do it just like this. I mean, that just no. doesn't exist. No, no. If you really think about our industry, the barrier for entry is so low uh, and I'm not going to throw our you know agents under the bus, but you get, you know, it, it, anybody who's doing business, you, you see it. You instantly think, think about this to get, to do somebody's hair, to get your cosmetology license in Florida, it's 1500 hours. <laughs> To be able to sell somebody's house and home it's is 60. 60. 
Like, like, there's something wrong with this oh, picture. Oh, man. That's a great point. Yeah, it's the same for here in Florida. It's a DBPR. It's the same certificate. It looks the same. It's exactly. The same thing. <laughs> oh, man. Right. And then there's no, that's, what, again, why we're doing this, to hopefully people can learn, and I like to learn, and I, you do too. Um, yeah. So let's talk about this, your referral-based business. Is, so you said 90%. So do you, what's your strategy of keeping in contact with your past clients? I mean, is your... It, I mean, maybe it is. Is your custody, is your transaction experience so amazing that they're like, "Oh, this is it for my, for life"? Or do you? Is there a follow up? Is there events? Like, what do you what do you do? Yeah. So, so it's it's. I think that's such a good question. I have been, I've taken my customer base a little for granted. Like, there's no reason why I I shouldn't have done 65 million last year. I think I've relied. I'll tell you where I'm at. Honestly, I've relied, and it, some of you may know exactly what I'm talking about your gifts and talents are going to take you so far. I have pretty much maximized my, my gifts and talents. Right. Like I would go into a listing appointment. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm just telling you the truth. Like I just wing it, man. I, because I know, I know my <laughs> well, because stuff. you've been there before. You're not going I've into an environment so you don't know. Right. No. Yeah. Like the first, you know, several I put in the work I put in the work I, I know, but at the same time, I think you could rest on your laurels a little bit if you're not careful. Once you start making some money, once you start getting a track record, it's easy to get comfortable. And so, well, but you can um, also say, you know, going into those appointments because I do the same thing. I used to stress out about it. Now I'm like, oh right, it starts in ten minutes. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. but we become experts. You become an expert at what you do, yeah. which means you already put in the you put in those hours and hours and hours and hours of that's of, true of listing appointments. So, but I do know what you're saying is like you take it for granted because you can. When you become an expert, you're like, I don't need to do anything else. I'm an expert, right? You you become like like Allen Iverson. If you ever seen the, the yes, uh, is it practice? Practice, you know. Yeah, you like, know, you saw you me know, play, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, to that point, he Alan was a Kobe. Never man. won a championship, <laughs> right? Kobe put. He wasn't in. Jordan. Right. Yes, they they stuck. They they outworked everybody, no matter how successful they were. And so, I'm in a place in my life right now where I'm excited because I think for the last two years, you know how it was. Like if you listed a property in Florida, oh. it was gone with multiple offers, and you know, it it, it just now. It's not like that. And honestly, I'm excited because I'm for the first time in the last couple of years, I actually get to market my listings and build again. my business. Right. Yes. And I get to get creative. You know what I love about the luxury space the most? Not only are the people great, most of the everyone has this bad perception of like, you know, the rich are evil. It's not honestly the most humble people that I've met is in the luxury space, the most giving people. I think the lower price point you work, the more stressful it is because money is not available to solve problems. Right. So one little thing in the transaction could kill the entire deal. Yep. Or Whereas just make it a negative experience. A right. terrible experience and you get all the blame and whatever. And so, you know, um, but going back, the, the the biggest piece that that I've learned for me is, you know, yes, the customer experience is important, but you gotta you gotta keep in touch with these people. And some of my best friends that I have to this day are people that I've met in an open house. And so I don't have a strategy, although I will. Going back the the luxury real estate space, I think it's going to open up not just luxury, but there's a lot of opportunities for us to get creative. And I, and that's what I love about my job is is that I get to scratch this creative itch that I have. And especially when you get a really, really unique property or a wow. higher priced property, you can't just throw it on the MLS. You know, you, you've got to get story, creative. Right? You, you got to tell, tell a story. Yeah. So that's awesome, man. Um, so what are so what are some major differences for luxury? Like you said, compared to non-luxury, like it, positive and negative. Mm -hmm. Like you just said. So, but. yeah. So I think, We'll start with positive. Positive is you could work a lot less and make a lot more money if you yeah. actually get the deals closed. And that's how really – so how I started back at that at that Berkshire Hathaway brokerage, there was a guy that – I hope I'm not offending. I hope the people that I'm talking about don't watch this, but everybody <laughs> else watch it. Um, but there was a guy who sold about $17 million and with 24 transactions. And then there was another um, kind of team in there that did like a hundred transactions and sold fifteen million Whew. with no assistant, no nothing. And I was just like, 
yeah, I, I don't, I don't want that life. Like I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't want to do. And I think it's weird in our industry. We really tout units. I, I don't know. look at units. I, I look at volume because it, there's a saying revenue is vanity. Profit is sanity. So we look into like, oh, how many units and we give awards based on this and all of these things. But really, you know, they're not telling you that, you know, there, there wasn't much profit made in those hundred, hundred deals that you just did. And you're basically sacrificing your sanity in order to like keep it afloat. And so that's one of the pro positives for me is you're able to move at us in a speed of you're able to be calm. Um, because they're Patient, bigger payoff. Too. Yes. You're, you're able to, able to be more selective. Um, you're able to be more creative. There's just more, it's, it's, I swear to you, it's just easier. It's easier to do the deals. Uh, that $5.5 .5 million listing that I, that I, that, that we sold, I represented the buyer on that. Yeah. There was a couple little bumps. But usually at that price point too, the other agent is no novice either. They're very good. They're very they're thinking of the deal also. I think that's the biggest difference to the second point is the people that you're you're interacting with throughout the transaction. So the title company is different. Most of the times it's a, it's attorney, so there's less errors, right? Yeah. The other agent is probably pretty seasoned. you know pretty seasoned and they're deal minded. They're not ego. Yes, you get some outliers and whatever, but by and large, even the even the egomaniacs, they know I'm not getting paid on this unless we close. And right. so there, I find there's so it's a, a, it's a, little, a collaboration feel more to it than than hundred percent. You get the lower price point. I feel agents just puffing their chests up. I'm like, we got to work together on this. But luxury, yeah, exactly. If you're luxury and you're doing those 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 clientele, that clientele trust that you know what you're doing, and which you usually do. And the only time you'll see some people get real egos in that price point is if you're up and coming or you're demonstrating that you don't really know what you're doing. And so there's a frustration from a seasoned agent, you know, but I try to I, I try to stay humble and remember, man, where I came from, you know, like, yeah, that's I, important. Yeah. And, and so I think it's important that, you know, we we. We respect people because here's the other thing. I'm probably going to see you on another deal in the future. I don't want to have a bad relationship with you, you know? Oh, yeah. So that's no, that's, that's so my important. mindset. Yeah. So I think those are some of the positives and, and some of the negatives were weaved into that. I mean, obviously, yeah. the expectations are very high and they should be. Um, you yeah. know, you're dealing with high net worth individuals who don't have a lot of time for BS or excuses. And so it's it's a little bit the stakes are higher and um, you know, you have to be better prepared for those negotiations. And I think you really, it's weird, actually. I don't know if this is a positive or negative. I think the more I think about this and the lower price point, it's probably more the case, but you have to have the ability to foresee problems before they arise. So I'm very proactive and not reactive. And, and I think, uh, you know, that comes with experience, which yeah. again, you know, and, and expertise, um, Awesome, man. Let's talk about some technology apps and tools because you're obviously running a pretty amazing business. What are some, what, what, like, do you use a CRM? If you do, what is it? What, what do you, what's a daily mm -hmm. thing that you just, just runs your business and you can't live without? What are some tools? So and first I thing, I technology. I'll, so I gotta, I gotta ask, I always gotta ask that. Me too. Me too. Um, so First, I know it's a technological question, but I gotta I gotta insert this in and give credit to where it's due. Um, if you are tapped out, hire a personal assistant. Do yourself a favor. There's the old saying, you know, if you don't have a personal assistant, you are your personal assistant. That's true, man. So you know, and and navigating and understanding when the right time is that's important. You don't want to do it too soon, but. Um, that, I mean, I, I couldn't run my business without Myra. She's phenomenal and she manages everything on the back end so that I could focus on, on what matters. And what does she manage? Transactions and yeah, she manages all my transactions, all the communications, the listing management. Um, she organizes everything in the CRM for me, which I use as what I use as follow-up boss. Yep, um, I, I like, cause it has the deals that you could input and I just like the, the, the format of follow-up boss. Um, but yeah, she manages, I and mean, she works just for you. She's hired by yeah. you. Or she, yeah. Amazing. She's full, full time, full time for me. And, uh, 
Yeah, that that that's the biggest. I mean, you, you're never going to be you're going to be doing a lot of busy work until you get to that point. And you yeah. shouldn't do it too soon. You should max out your time, you know. Yeah. But once once that time, when, once you hit that, then it's it's really wise to to hire somebody that can help you. And it really does take a team in order to yeah, you know start hitting some big numbers. Yeah. So what's your favorite app? What do you use oh, on a daily? Favorite. Okay, Instagram. <laughs> uh, right. It's such uh, a great tool, like for business, it really is. I learned so much from from Instagram. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I know people people will say that's not a business app. That's a social media app. No, for the businessman, it is. I don't look. I don't post. You know what I'm eating for lunch unless I think it's an opportunity for me to like just sure. connect with. My audience, to me, it's a hundred percent a marketing platform for for your business. So, yeah, I'm on Instagram, Facebook every single day, sending d you know DMs. Facebook not as much. I haven't gotten into TikTok as much as I would like to, but right. the YouTube is the YouTube channel is starting to to really take off. Um, yeah, man, you've, you've got all these properties, man. I want to, I'm going to look, I'm going to start watching you more. Subscribe. I, looks looking at sexy properties. You know what I mean? Everybody 100%. does. And, and I'm so embarrassed. I mean, if you go on there, hopefully by the time this, this podcast gets gotta, released and you'll yeah. see more. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I see, and that's the problem. So because I've been so reliant on the 90% of referrals that I've get in, I've also been, you know, awakened to the fact what would happen if I actually marketed myself more, like really, truly marketed myself, not just every time you have a listing, but just me promoting me as yeah. a, you know, right. a solution to people's value. problems. Dude, you, you're super knowledgeable, man. Like you could, you've already provided a, a ton of value in what, 30, 40 minutes. So, I mean, I the amount of that. value you can give on, so, I mean, that's what I love to do. And I know that you have that all, I mean, this is insane. Um, yeah. So let's do uh, one more question. We'll wrap it up. So yep. people don't learn from their success. They learn from their failures. What is mm. a, what is a failure you had, whether it was early in your career, mid career that you learned from and that even if it's a, not a big one, but something that you said, I'm never going to do that again. Lesson learned. Ooh, haven't got time to go over all those lessons, <laughs> but the, the, the first one that comes to mind is uh, you never spend your chickens, never, never count your chickens before they hatch. So never, ever spend money. You're, you're, ba you're, you're predicting I've got, I've got this much in the pipeline. This is closing. Okay. I can go do, don't ever do that. Don't spend money that you don't have. I learned that lesson the hard way my first year. Another big lesson that I've learned is you don't become wealthy selling other people's real estate. There you go. I want you to think about that because yep. as, as agents, we get so busy selling everyone else's real estate, but we have no retirement plan in place. We, we, we're just, we just eat what we kill and it's cool. I love that. I love the grind, but again, you know, be smart, be smart. Think about, you know, Long how term. can I act? Yeah. What kind of life do you want to live at the end of the day? It's not impressive to me if you're making a bunch of money or this, but you have no life. Your health is in decline. You don't take care of yourself. Your, your, your wife hates you because you're never home. Like right. these are all the things that I look at. So, you know, I think it's important. I don't like the word balance, but I do think, you know, knowing your worth and knowing the value that you provide, you should have some boundaries in place with your clients. Like I talk to clients or agents all the time. Oh, you know how it is. You know, you got to work 24 seven and we can, dude, I don't work like that. Yeah. I don't, I did that my first two years. I don't do that anymore. Sure. Right. Like, yeah. I, did, I do believe your first two years, you do hustle and learn and do what you need to do. But once you yeah. kind of get in your groove, cause then you learn to set expectations, right? Exactly. You, you set expectations and you, and you follow those and you honor your family, you honor yourself, you honor your time, your health, all these things, because you're no good to your clients. If you're, if you're zapped of energy, you're right. freaking burnout. You, you're, you're no, you're no good. You're not pleasant to be around. So you know, I rarely work a Sunday, rarely, yeah. you know, well, it and, sounds and like you've, yeah. you go back to you, how you think about business is that to be proactive as opposed to reactive, right? So you being, based yeah. your whole life on being proactive of like, oh, this is how it's going to play out. And yes, exactly. you can deal with probably hiccups and emergencies and fires and all that stuff. But um, yeah. dude, this has yeah. been awesome. I, I could keep talking to you for a long time and we obviously will because we're in the same city. So we're going to break some bread together. hundred uh, percent. Where can people reach you if they want to, if they have any questions or just want to follow you or anything, where, where, where can people reach yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to say this. If, if anyone wants to reach out, I'm an open book. One of the things that I hated about getting into the real estate agent was a lot of agents have the scarcity mi mindset. Unlike you, Mark, unlike me. 
um, where they're they're withholding information because they view you as competition. So if any of you ever, you know, if I can help you with anything, feel free to reach out. But um, everywhere on social media, Harif Hazara or the Hazara team and um, the Apollo's website YouTube, is the, subscribe to his YouTube channel, right? <laughs> sm- smash that like button as you, uh, <laughs> as you younger, younger people like to say, right. yes, YouTube everywhere, everywhere on social. It's Harif Hazara. Well, follow him, man. I've, I've watched him. He gives some good tips on just like mindset and all that stuff. So I can't wait to see what you do next. And uh, everybody, thanks for listening. And we will definitely see you on the next one. Wow, man, that guy is awesome. Um, he's actually in my market and I've never met him before. So we will definitely, I'll definitely be hanging out with that guy. His mindset is unbelievable how he just turned nothing into something. I actually saw him on Instagram the other day and he looked like he was on a private jet. So that is super cool. The, the life he has created. So go ahead and follow, follow him, uh, reach out to him. If you have questions, he's a super cool guy, super down to earth. And also thanks for listening. We really appreciate you. Um, if you haven't yet, go ahead and subscribe. So, cause we have a lot more guests coming on and hopefully you're learning stuff. Subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And I would greatly appreciate it if you could give us a five-star review and that way our podcast actually gets referred to to other agents who want to learn just like you and it would help us grow a lot and I would really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening and I'll see you on the next one.